Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. David Buss. He's Professor of Psychology at the University of Texas at Austin and today we're going to talk about his new book, When Men Behave Badly, The Hidden Roots of Sexual Deception, Harassment and Assault. So Dr. Buss, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on again. Yeah, great to be here again, Ricardo. Uh, by the way, can you just uh, show the book to the camera because I don't have a physical copy with me. Yeah, yeah, I just got, let's see, can you see that? Yes, yes, okay, so there it is, guys, and that that's going to be the focus of our conversation today. So, I mean, uh, in the book you talk about, as you say in the title, sexual deception, harassment, assault, so it all goes down to sexual conflict, I guess. Uh, so, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, how would you say we should understand sexual conflict? Well, uh, yeah, so, well, sexual conflict is the root uh, of, of conflict between the sexes, and uh, from an evolutionary perspective, sexual, uh, sexual reproduction evolved, estimates vary, but let's say approximately 1.3 billion years ago. And so sexual reproduction is a very ancient reproductive system where you have two sexes. Uh, the sex is being defined by the size of the gametes. So males are defined as the ones with the small gametes. They're basically in, in humans a very tiny packet of DNA with a, an outboard motor designed to propel them to the uh, nutrient-rich large egg cell, which the females have. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the, the size of the sex cells determines the sex. And so once you have this uh, separation uh, where in order to reproduce, you have to find one of the other sex cells or you have bodies that have to find each other that contain the other sex cells, then you have the evolution of sexual reproduction. And with that comes a whole suite of things that differentiate according to sex in terms of reproductive apparatus, reproductive physiology, reproductive anatomy, and of course, reproductive psychology. Um, and so uh, I'm a human evolutionary psychologist, and so I focus on the human uh, elements of sexual conflict, uh, but sexual conflict occurs in all sexually reproducing species, from the common fruit fly all the way up to uh, primates and humans. And so, in a nutshell, what sexual conflict is, is that there are certain zones uh, of conflict or regions where what's in the best interest, reproductively speaking, of a male uh, differs from what's in the best interest of a female. So, for example, um, uh, initiating sexual intercourse, in the case of humans, uh, sooner or with less time elapsed or with less investment is, is often advantageous for males, but disadvantageous for females. And so very much like predators and prey, you have these co-evolutionary arms races where each sex is trying to influence the other to be closer to its optimum. So you have these zones of conflict uh, where, uh, as I said, what's in the best interest of a, a male and female differ. And so what we expect is adaptations in each sex to deal with these zones of conflict and resulting in co-evolutionary arms races, which are very much, I draw that, a very close analogy to predators and prey, where with predators and prey, these are different species that are locked in co-evolutionary arms races where for each increment in the speed and agility of a uh, prey that selects for increments in speed and agility of predators. And so you see predators and prey locked in these perpetual co-evolutionary arms races where the, 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 the weaker, the slower, the less fleet of foot basically get eaten if they're prey. And if they are predators, the, the weaker, the less uh, the fast, the more fleet of the, the less fleet of foot, they starve to death because they can't catch the prey. And so uh, in each generation, there is this um, selection for adaptations to combat the counter-adaptations in the other. And I argue that 
uh, in, in my book that analogous co-evolutionary arms races occur within species between males and females. Mm -hmm. Right. But, I mean, we also have to take into account perhaps uh, mate preferences from both males and females, because I was imagining that particularly when it comes to understanding uh, I mean, if a person is already in a romantic relationship, but then according, if there's, for example, some mate value discrepancies and they are looking for another partner that are more, that is more in line with their mate value, then that could also lead to some sexual conflict, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, so there are two points, I think, to make about that. So one, one is that um, you talk about long-term relationships, and uh, humans are at least somewhat unique in the animal kingdom in forming long-term committed mateships. And so there, is, uh, there are large regions of cooperation. So, um, and, and in fact, there was a sea change historically in the field of evolutionary biology where they viewed sexual reproduction uh, as inherently a cooperative venture, where it's in the best interest of a male and female to meet up, to pair up, and to invest in mutually produced offspring. And it wasn't until uh, Jeffrey Parker was one of the first, uh, perhaps the first uh, evolutionary biologist to say, no, actually, within the context of cooperation, there are regions of conflict between the sexes, and those have to be understood. Now, you bring up mate value discrepancies, and this is a key um, a source of sexual conflict that I talk about in the book. And it plays out in many, many forms. Um, uh, in the book, I, I distinguish between three temporal phases of mating. So one is sort of what I call mating market conflict. So uh, before any mating takes place. Second is after a mateship is formed. And the third is after a breakup, after a romantic breakup. And the issue of mate value discrepancies that you raise occurs at all three stages. So one of the interesting things is that, so for example, uh, I, I don't know if this is true in European systems, but in America we have this, this crude 10 point scale, you know, where someone's an eight or someone's a 10, or someone's a six. Do they have something analogous in, in European systems? Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure, at least where I live here in Portugal, we don't usually talk in those terms, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, but I think it's, you know, there's a, you know, there, there, people know intuitively what it means in the sense of people say, oh, he's not good enough for you, or, you know, you deserve someone better. Uh, so there are these informal phrases that kind of capture the logic here. But, but so let's put it in numerical terms. So if, if, let's say, a man is a six and he's attracted to a woman who's an eight on the mating market, uh, then there's, a, there's an inherent conflict. Uh, she, she doesn't, she thinks she deserves a higher mate value guy and he's resentful that she doesn't find him higher in mate value. And, and part of the reason this becomes a problem is that you would think that selection would produce adaptations to be maximally accurate in tracking your own mate value. But there's a very large literature that suggests that men especially tend to overestimate their own mate value. So this guy who's a six, he might think he's an eight, and so feels perfectly within her mate value range, uh, but she perceives otherwise. She's, um, you know, and sometimes she's going after a nine or a 10. Uh, so, so there's mating market conflict, and then you launch this issue of within a romantic relationship. And so on average, people who tend to assort or match up on overall mate value. So the eights mate with the eighth, the sixes with the six, the tens with the tens, but nothing remains static. Mate value is not a, a static fixed property of individuals. It changes with the tides of the time. Uh, it changes when you get a job promotion. It changes when you increase in status or lose your job or decrease your status or get ill or get an injury or a key, um, social ally of yours dies and so you lose a critical um, component of your of your mate value uh, and so things change over time and so within a couple sometimes the discrepancy starts out little and then gets larger uh, uh, and so if it gets too much of course there are costs associated with breaking up 
breaking up is a very costly endeavor typically, especially if they have a couple as kids and they have their finances in mesh. Um, but sometimes the benefits of trading up or getting out of a made ship are sufficient to outweigh the costs of doing so. And so if a, if a large enough mate value discrepancy emerges, then it's in the woman's interest or the man's interest to uh, to divorce or break up and then seek someone else. And uh, one of the um, uh, upsetting things to some people is that people cultivate, uh, I talk about this in, in the book, uh, uh, they cultivate backup mates, uh, even when they're in a relationship and even when they're in a happy relationship. And, uh, and, and I think it's an important adaptation, an important mating adaptation, because when you think about ancestral conditions, something disastrous could always happen. You know, your partner could, could die in, if it's a woman in childbirth or if it's a man in a warfare or in a club fight, uh, or, uh, you know, and, and so all of a sudden you're left high and dry with no mate. And so what we find, this is work I did with uh, Josh Dunkley, former graduate student and now a professor, um, and what we found is that people, while they're in relationships, cultivate these backup partners, and uh, especially women become very upset if their backup mate gets in, involved in a long-term relationship with someone else. It's like they, they want to keep the backup mate there as a possibility in case something should happen. And, and, and the reason it's upsetting to people is people think, well, I'm in a happy relationship, but you know, their partner has in the back of their mind churning away, no, well, I'm going to just keep this low-level backup mate, mild flirtation with them going, uh, you know, just in case something happens. So people kind of lay the groundwork uh, for mate switching. Mm -hmm. But just to take a step back, let me just ask you, uh, why is it that you titled the book When Men Behave Badly? Is it that you're focusing mostly on, I mean, strategies perhaps that come from men when it comes to all of these things surrounding harassment, assault, and so on? Or, or is it that you do that because it is men who resort more to those kinds of strategies? Yeah, a great question, Ricardo. So when I started writing the book, I, uh, you know, um, was dealing uh, with this overarching framework of sexual conflict theory, uh, and I envisioned, you know, an, sort of equal treatment for men and women. And so the book, even the first five or so chapters of the book, does that. So I talk about how men deceive women on the mating market, how women deceive men on the mating market, and they both do. Um, but at, as the book progresses, I get into um, uh, more disturbing topics. So, as you say, uh, intimate partner violence, stalking, sexual harassment, sexual coercion, sexual assault. And the more extreme you get on these, um, in these domains, the, the more men to have a, tend to have a monopoly on, on being perpetrators of these more extreme forms of what, what I generically call sexual violence, because all these things, stalking, intimate partner violence, are ultimately about sexual violence. They're about controlling and coercing the female uh, to, um, to, to retain her for, for, that, for that male, either for short term or for long term. And so, uh, and, and so over the course of the book, so the second half of the book deals with uh, more centrally males as perpetrators and adaptations in women to defend against these more extreme forms of sexual violence. Uh, now, it, it is true, of course, that, that women engage in, let's say, intimate partner violence. Women do engage in stalking. But, um, but as I said, the more extreme you get, the more men have a tend to monopoly. So, for example, in criminal stalking, uh, about 80% of the perpetrators tend to be men and about 20% women. Uh, when you get to sexual harassment, you know, you're getting up into the 90s, uh, male perpetrators, female victims. When you get to sexual assault, you're talking 99 plus percent of men perpetrators and women victims. Uh, and so I think it's important to, um, to keep in mind that 
uh, although there are these co-evolutionary arms races, and although women do absolutely do bad stuff to men on the mating market, uh, these more extreme forms of sexual violence tend to be perpetrated by men. Mm -hmm. And that's why, so, I tell, that's why I tell the book, When Men Behave Badly. One other qualification that I'll mention about that is that it's not all men, and it's not all men all of the time. And so the, the when is important because what the book tries to do is identify the circumstances, which men under which circumstances engage in which forms of sexual violence. Uh, and so it's not a book about male bashing. It's about trying to identify the causal conditions of sexual violence with the hope that I, only by identifying the causal conditions can we have any hope of um, eliminating these um, uh, really uh, uh, unethical and um, criminal, often criminal forms of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. So, and since you do things in the book or you approach these issues uh, from an evolutionary lens, do you also take into account social, cultural perspectives on these issues? Because I was just thinking that maybe uh, some of these could add something to the picture, particularly when trying to understand behavior from a more proximate perspective. Uh, absolutely. So um, uh, one of the things that evolutionary psychology does is it does not divide the world into two categories of things, those that are evolved and those that are social or those that are cultural. Uh, in fact, evolutionary psychology breaks down that, uh, what we call a false dichotomy. Uh, and, so, and so there are a couple of different um, lenses to, to view that, and I'll just mention a couple. Uh, one is that uh, evolved adaptations evolve specifically to be responsive to uh, in this case, social contexts. Uh, and so, for example, uh, sex ratio, the ratio of males to females in the mating pool, uh, we have adaptations that are responsive to those. And so if there's a surplus of women, for example, men tend to shift their mating strategies more toward short-term mating and less toward long-term mating. When there's a surplus of men in the mating pool, men uh, tend to count their blessings if they're able to attract one of the few women around and they hold on for dear life. Uh, uh, so uh, sex ratio is very important. Uh, so, uh, and, and so, so that's sort of one cut is that we have adaptations to deal with um, our own mate value, the mate values of our competitors, the sex ratio and the eligible mating pool uh, but also social norms. We, we are a social species where we have adaptations to assess what are the prevailing norms, what's going to lead to high status or uh, disaster in terms of my reputation. Uh, and so we're very responsive to that. And then yet another angle is um, laws that are created that surround these things. So as one example, uh, marital rape. Um, marital rape used to be in the West, in Western cultures an incoherent concept. That is, there was no such thing. You could, rape was criminal, but it was only if the victim was someone outside of the mateship. And so, uh, uh, but then there were, uh, so, so when you think about it, um, who created these laws that, def that said that marital rape is not rape, it's, it's, it's a male entitlement. Well, I think if women were creating the laws, they wouldn't have created those, those laws to begin with. So, so what I'm saying is that these are, you can call these patriarchal structures, if you will, but they're not, it's not like there's this autonomous causal process called patriarchy. Rather, the laws, in this case, the patriarchal laws, are products of male evolved sexual psychology. Uh, and so, the key point that I'm making in answer to your question is, is the world isn't divided up into things that are evolved and things that are social. Uh, it's all evolved psychology. Uh, evolved psychology creates the cultural and social conditions that we encounter, and our evolved psychology is designed to deal with variations in those social contexts. Mm -hmm. So, do you also consider, for example, feminists, feminist perspectives on these issues? Because uh, 
Uh, I mean, things like rape, for example, sexual assault, harassment at work are things that very easily get politicized. But do you think that uh, we can also deal with that kind of perspective that it would add some value to these types of questions or not? Yes, uh, the answer is yes from my perspective, um, uh, but one has to pick and choose. So there are uh, elements, so I'll give you an example. You raised the issue of rape, which I talk about in great depth in the book. I devote two chapters to that. One is trying to identify the psychology of perpetrators, and the other is to trying to identify de women's defenses against it. But So, um, uh, so one, one issue is uh, that feminists historically have raised is, is, is rape about power or is, about, is it about sex? And um, historically, there's been a division among evolutionary psychologists and feminists who have written about it, which I think is, is um, uh, somewhat um, misguided in the following sense, that uh, from the male point of view, you, you can't eliminate sex as a, a motivation, and certainly from an evolutionary point of view. Um, but from the perspective of the victim, and this is partly through a, reading feminist literature, but partly through talking to women who are feminists. And I've asked them that question, why do they think that sex is not part of the picture? And their answer is that from the perspective of the victim, it isn't sex, it's, it's violence. And, and I think they're absolutely right. From the perspective of the victim, it is violence. And from an evolutionary perspective, it's a form of violence that bypasses female choice. You know, we, we know that female choice, this traces back to Darwin's theory of sexual selection, 1871. Female choice is perhaps the first law of, of mating, uh, preferential mate choice, the freedom to choose who, when, where, and with whom she has sex. And when that freedom of choice is bypassed, uh, it's of course extremely upsetting and extremely costly from an evolutionary perspective. So. To get back to your, your key question, I think that uh, feminist uh, writings have um, been important in bringing some elements uh, to prominence, such as from the victim's perspective versus the perpetrator's perspective. Uh, however, I think that some elements are uh, also misguided. So, for example, the notion that um, the implicit and sometimes explicit notion that men are united in their interests uh, to, in oppressing women as a group, that can't be true from an evolutionary perspective because, uh, among other things, males are primarily competitors with other males. So they're not united with other males in any sense of the word. They're, that's why males kill each other. Uh, you know, ma male male killing is perpetrated mostly by men and the victims are mostly other men. And so, um, and so men have no interest in holding up, you know, males as a united group. And of course, women also, their primary competitors are other women. Uh, but each individual has strategic alliances with some members of their own sex and some members of the opposite sex. So it is true that males do form coalitions, uh, alliances, uh, and that they have some uh, overlap of fitness interests with other males, but they also have sisters and mothers and daughters, and so um, and and they are, you have some overlap in fitness interests with those individuals, uh, and so I think an evolutionary lens uh, really clarifies uh, which elements of feminist positions are. Uh, important to incorporate and which elements are misguided. Mm -hmm. And it also helps us elucidate why in this case particularly women suffer the way they suffer from these different sorts of violence, right? Yes, yeah, that is, I mean, it's one of the fascinating things, so, and I talk about this in, in the book, that uh, sexual violence is the most um, upsetting thing to women period. Uh, it's more upsetting than physical violence. It's more upsetting than a whole host of things men can do to women. Um, and from an evolutionary perspective, uh, it's very clear why that's the case. That, that is, 
bypassing female choice is, is tremendously costly. And one of the things that for me was a real eye opener was a study that I did that I go into some detail in the book. I did this with Karen Perilou, who I know you interviewed as, as well. Uh, and the title of the study that we published was The Costs of Rape. And what we did is we had a sample of rape victims. We had a sample of women who were, uh, had been um, perpetrators, had attempted to rape them, but they had managed to fend off the perpetrator. And then another group w who did not experience either attempted or completed rape. And, one, and we assessed them on things like self-esteem, depression, um, uh, work productivity, school productivity, a whole host of psychological and social variables. And what we found is basically a stepwise function that is um, the, the, the rape victims suffered from depression, from lowered self-esteem, from post-traumatic stress sim uh, symptoms. Uh, from uh, a decreased social life. Uh, often the, a rape will interfere with a woman's primary mateship, uh, high rates of breakup after, uh, after a rape occurs. Uh, and, so, and so it really has dramatic consequences for, for victims. Uh, and, um, and, and that's why I think women have uh, such elaborate defenses to prevent it from occurring. And I think what this is in chapter eight of the book where I talk extensively about women's defenses. And I think I present the most comprehensive taxonomy of defenses against rape that uh, go from like what women uh, do to prevent it from occurring to begin with, what they do to fend it off during a course of an attempted rape, and then also the aftermath of the rape. So as an example, women often conceal the rape and people often say, well, this, you know, rape victims are shamed, uh, which they, they often are, but there's a very important reason why women conceal it and why rape rates are so underreported is because revealing it causes reputational damage to the, to the woman, um, damages her perceived mate value, uh, interferes with her social relationships, her mateships and so forth. And so, um, and so I think it's important to, examine these defenses and, and address the question of which ones are effective, which ones are not effective. Uh, so, so I think in, in some ways that's the most important chapter in the book. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're going to come back to what we can do about all of these issues later in the interview. But now, I mean, let me ask you about mate guarding behavior, because that's another source of some of these more violent acts, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, well, we know, um, so I've been writing about mate, mate guarding and mate retention for a long time, and uh, subtitle of my articles on that are, that are from vigilance to violence. Um, and uh, w early on, we identified 19, 19 different tactics that men and women both use to guard their mate or to retain their mate. I use the term mate retention. Uh, the mate guarding term comes from the insect literature where there's like literally the males guard the females and, um, and, and humans do that too, but that's just one of the things they do. And, you know, in the modern world, we, we do mate guarding through, uh, you know, uh, uh, tracking the, uh, keystrokes of our, our mate, uh, uh, hacking their cell phone, hacking their computers, um, using spyware. Uh, there are even uh, apps. So I mentioned one in the book that I think is from Saudi Arabia, where there's an app where um, that alerts the husband if the, if his wife tries to leave the country. Uh, so uh, so the, these uh, tracking apps. So uh, apps. So so the key thing here is that um, you know. Mating is a complicated process. You know, you have to assess your own mate value. You have to go after mates who are within your mate value range. You go through all this process of attracting a mate, courting a mate, obtaining a mate, and you think I've done all this. Now my job is done, but it's not done. You have to you have to keep a mate. Uh, mates' gain must be retained, uh, at least from an from an evolutionary perspective, in order to reap the benefits of you know, why you selected a long-term mate to begin with. So people mate guard 
And what we find in our research, I've done research on married couples, on dating couples, um, and people mate guard when the adaptive problem of mate guarding rears its head. So when does the adaptive problem of mate guarding rear its head? Well, one is if the partner is giving off cues to defection, so uh, signs of infidelity or signs that they might leave the relationship. Uh, two is the presence of mate poachers, so, um, you know, other interests. So uh, if you have a desirable mate, um, there are even song, popular songs written about it. Uh, watch your friends. Um, if you're married to a beautiful woman, watch your friends, uh, because friends can become mate poachers and attempt to lure away your partner for either a short-term sexual encounter or for a, a longer-term mateship. And so if there are mate poachers, especially if they're desirable mate poachers around, then that tends to trigger mate, mate guarding or mate retention efforts. Um, mate value discrepancies is another thing. So even if there's no mate, mate poachers or no signs of infidelity or defection, if there's a mate value discrepancy, people start to get jealous. And jealousy is one of the key emotions that motivates mate guarding. So uh, let's say the, uh, the guy loses his job. Well, we know you had raised the issue earlier of mate preferences. Well, we know that um, women, other things being equal, prefer men who have resources, have economic viability, have good job prospects, um, and are willing to devote those resources to her and her children. But the guy loses his job. Uh, and I think that actually this is one of the reasons why there's been a, a spike in intimate partner violence during the pandemic is that pe people have lost their jobs um, and then they're, they're kind of locked up uh, in some places in lockdown with someone who is not bringing in resources. Uh, and so if there's a mate value discrepancy, that can motivate intense mate guarding and for males who have benefits to provide, there's less of a need to inflict costs. So generically, you can think of two, these two big classes of mate guarding tactics, inflicting costs and, and providing benefits. Providing benefits, the person wants, wants to stay. You inflict costs and that can drive the person away, but it, it also can, and this is, people will be very disturbed about this. So I devote a chapter to, um, uh, intimate partner violence, the hypothesis that it's actually functional. So people want to think that intimate partner violence is a pathology. Um, and what I argue is that it, it, it is activated under very specific conditions, um, the adaptive problems that I just mentioned, and it is functional in the sense that it's designed to make the woman believe that she can't do better, uh, and also to punish her for any signs of infidelity or defection. And we know people are responsive to that. And so one of the things that guys who engage in, in intimate partner violence is also called uh, domestic violence, and there are other, you know, wife battering, other terms for it, uh, uh, is that um, these guys try to cut off the woman's relationships with her friends and her kin group. And this is a critical thing because, um, you know, having what I call bodyguards is a critical defense, not just against intimate partner violence, but also against some of these other things like sexual assault. Bodyguards are an extremely important thing. And so what the guy, the violent guys try to do is they cut off, try to cut off her friendships, cut off her relationships with her family, and hence cut off the bodyguard that she would have otherwise to defend against these coercive forms of control. And, and so guys who, who don't have the benefits to provide, um, the, they are at risk, in fact, statistically, of losing the woman. And so sometimes they engage in violence as a means of trying to keep her. Now, one of the um, truly unfortunate consequences is that it works sometimes. So, uh, so one of the ways in which it works, we think, is that it lowers women's self-esteem. And women's self-esteem, people's self-esteem is in part a reflection of their perceived mate value. If, if I think that I'm, I'm worthless, then 
I think I'm, no one's going to want me. I'm, my mate value is very low. Uh, and and self-esteem has other functions. This isn't its sole function. But one of the things that getting beaten up does is it lowers people's self-esteem. And, so, and, and then also one of the things that we found in our studies is that there's a co-variation or co-occurrence of verbal or psychological abuse with the physical abuse. So it's not just he's beating her up. He's beating her up and telling her she's worthless, that she's ugly, she's you know, a terrible person. Uh, and uh, so attempts to tear down her, her self-esteem or self-worth. Um, so just to bring this point home, that the, the unfortunate thing is it sometimes works, now not always, is that there was a study of women at shelters for battered women. And this, this study looked at 100 women who went to shelters. And these are women who've gotten beaten up. Um, and what they found is that the vast majority ended up going back to their abuser. Uh, and so the reasons were, uh, they say, well, uh, I felt sorry for him. He apologized and said he would never do it again, which is bullshit because they often tend to do it again. Uh, uh, I realized I loved them, or I had nowhere else to go, or my kids, uh, we had no money, uh, we had no shelter, we had no house, we had to go back to them. Uh, so there are different reasons why women go back to them, but, uh, but you know, and, and you know that the women who land in the shelters for battered women, these are extreme cases. These aren't cases of, you know, mild slapping or anything. These are, you have to get pretty extreme before a woman takes herself and her kids to a shelter for battered women. Uh, so, uh, so the key point is that sometimes it works. Sometimes it works temporarily in, in holding on to the woman for a period of time, even if she eventually manages to leave. But again, from an evolutionary point of view, you know, holding on to that valuable reproductive resource is the goal. Uh, and so, and this is, this is disturbing for people who want to think, well, no, it's just guys who are pathological or have something wrong with their brains who do this. And it's, and it's, it's not the case, or at least that's, that's what I argue in the book. Right. Are there any examples of evolutionary mismatches when it comes to sexual conflict? I mean, are there... Because of the conditions we live in modern industrialized societies, are there, for example, any forms of sexual conflict that are specific to these kinds of societies? Yeah, I, I think there, there are, uh, there are, it's a very important concept of evolutionary mismatches. And there are, I, I think I highlight uh, five or six evolutionary mismatches in the book that um, don't necessarily create conflict, but exacerbate it uh, or make it worse. So, uh, so for example, um, one is that we evolved in the context of small group living where we had social allies, uh, often kin uh, or friendship allies. So, uh, but now we often live um, away from our uh, genetic families. So, Women go off to college at some distant university many miles away, and they don't have their brothers around, their fathers, their mothers, their sisters uh, to protect them or offer uh, as bodyguards. So that's one, um, one form of mismatch. Another, of course, is internet dating. So uh, if you live in small groups, then you get to know other people and their um, Reputation, of course, is a very important element when it comes to humans. And so people develop reputations. Oh, you don't want to get involved with this guy. He tends to beat up women, for example. Uh, but in the modern environment with Internet dating, you, you, you're dealing with an absence of information. And people, we know that people deceive in their Internet dating profiles. And so there's been, you know, I don't want to call it an epidemic because it's hard to track um, any good stats on this, but we know that sexual predators do use internet dating services to troll for victims. Um, and so, um, uh, so internet dating is something, that, and that's an evolutionarily novel technology. Obviously, we don't have adaptations for internet dating, you know, per se. Um, what else? What are some other um, 
modern forms of mismatch. Well, another is um, is uh, drugs. Uh, uh, so even even alcohol in concentrated forms is relatively evolutionarily novel. Alcohol has been around, you know, in the form of fermented fruit for for a long time, and its cultivation is wine for maybe wine and beer for maybe seven thousand years or so ballpark. Uh, but it's um, distillation in concentrated forms uh, is evolutionarily novel. And of course, date rape drugs like rohypnol is evolutionarily novel. And one of the things that these things do, alcohol and some of these drugs, is they, they disarm female defenses. So when you are under the influence of, let's say, a strong alcoholic beverage, um, you know, and, and we know that people spike, you know, Kool-Aid or whatever sweet drink there is, uh, it makes you physically weaker. It makes your uh, your judgment, your perception uh, cloudy, uh, and so you are less able to fend off um, sexual predators when you're under the influence of these things. And so it's kind of that's another evolutionary mismatch, I think, which uh, exacerbates conflict between the sexes. Mm -hmm. And we've been focusing on heterosexual relationships. Is there any good research on sexual conflict among gay men and lesbian women? Yeah, there, there is some. Uh, and in my book, it, it is, um, I do focus primarily, although not exclusively, primarily on heterosexual uh, individuals who, uh, and part of that is simply because there isn't enough research. Uh, there is research that Things like uh, jealousy and uh, spousal battering do occur in lesbian relationships and in gay male relationships, uh, but there hasn't been as extensive uh, research in these non-heterosexual uh, or non-binary, as they're called these days, um, populations. And so I think I think more research is needed on these populations before we draw any any big conclusions about them. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, can the information that you present in the book help explain modern social movements like, for example, the Me Too movement in the case of women and in the case of men, the, the so-called incel movement? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I talk about both of those a little bit in the book, and I think it's, it's fascinating. I think that, um, you know, the, the Me Too movement, the central theme, as I understand it, of the Me Too movement is uh, females wanting to exercise freedom of mate choice, okay, female choice, and saying we are no longer going to allow bypassing of a female choice, uh, be it through sexual harassment or sexual assault or sexual coercion. Um, and uh, so, so I think it's, it's really very relevant. Um, and uh, it, it's a modern form of what women have been trying to do for, you could say, um, millions of years is exercise freedom of choice. And in fact, I view sexual violence against women as, and, and I borrow this in part from Steve Pinker, uh, uh, it, it, as the most widespread human rights violation in the world. Um, and this may seem like an extraordinarily claim, but we have, you know, freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of the press, freedom of peaceful assembly. But uh, I think freedom of made choice, uh, you know, again, who, where, when, and under which circumstances you have sex should be a human fundamental right. And it's a right that is bypassed through sexual harassment, through sexual coercion, through sexual assault, through intimate partner violence through stalking, and it affects half of the population. And it transcends every ethnic group, every religious group, every cultural group in the world. Uh, and, so, uh, and so that's why I say it's the most widespread human rights violation. It, it affects everybody, and not just primary victims. When we think about primary victims as the victims of sexual harassment or sexual assault, you can also think about secondary victims. So uh, the, it harms um, their family, the people who care about them, their partners, their sisters, their mothers, their fathers, 
uh, who are also traumatized by sexual assault of someone they care about. Uh, so they're secondary victims. And um, women who do not get sexually assaulted often live in fear that they will get sexually assaulted and so engage in uh, all kinds of effort and energy to avoid it, to avoid going out at night, avoid walking in the dark, uh, ins ensuring that they have bodyguards if they do, uh, going through all this effort to, to prevent becoming a victim. Well, that's also costly. So, so you have the primary victims and then, and then a whole suite of secondary victims. And so the, the costs kind of rant of sexual violence against women kind of ramify out uh, through the whole, uh, through, through to, to most people are affected in one way or another. You know, I, in my case, at, at a personal level, I know uh, at least half a dozen women who have been sexually assaulted, who, who have been raped. Um, and those are just the ones that I know about who feel comfortable enough to have disclosed that information to me. And I'm sure that there are many others who um, have been that I don't, that I don't know about. And this, this is even before we get to sexual harassment. Uh, so, um, uh, so I don't know if that answers your, your question. There. Uh, yeah, I also asked you about the incel movement, but I oh, don't yeah. know if you have anything to say about it. Yeah, yeah, the incel movement is, is really interesting, and I don't, um, I haven't studied it in depth, so I don't know. Um, these are for for listeners. Uh, in, incel is uh, an acronym for involuntarily celibate. So these are men who are attracted to women and, and desire women and desire to have sex with women, but who women do not um, reciprocate that desire. Um, and so, and often they're very angry about it um, and angry at the women who reject them and angry at the men who women choose. So they're in cell movement, they have names for these people. I think the women they call Stacy's and the men they call Chad's or I think that's 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 right is the, the the guys that the women do prefer to mate with and they're resentful about it um this resentment so although the the, the acronym in the movement might be new in some movement um uh, anger at being rejected it goes way 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 back i mean to invoke a, a um a pop song there was this band called the doors i don't know if that's if people know about the doors nowadays but Jim Morrison singing, uh, uh, women seem wicked when you're unwanted, you know, and so that was one of his lyrics. And, and so that's, you know, men, when they get rejected and their attractions are not reciprocated, start to feel very resentful uh, about women. And so, yeah, I think that uh, it, it is a source of conflict and it's a source of conflict that occurs from these uh, perceived mate value discrepancies where um, women um, don't find these guys within their mate value range, uh, and so they're rejecting them. They're exercising freedom of choice, uh, and it causes resentment among those who are who are rejected. Mm -hmm. uh, so, with this knowledge, is it possible to already devise some specific strategies to prevent? these forms of more violent sexual conflict, like, for example, I don't know, rape, harassment, and things like that? Yes, I, I think there are paths to take, and, and just by way of um, framing an answer to your question, so earlier in my career, so I've you know, been an evolutionary psychologist for many years, and uh, I've always considered myself a basic researcher, and almost, um, you know, arrogantly, in retrospect, um, derided people who were applied, you know, tried to apply the knowledge. But, but it, I really think it was, it was a misguided way of thinking on my part. And I really dramatically shifted, in part through writing this book, that um, I think that the science, this deep knowledge of our evolved sexual psychology can be used to prevent or lower the rates of these forms of sexual violence, sexual harassment, stalking, intimate partner violence, and sexual, uh, sexual assault. And I think that um, I, I go in, in, in the book, I go into many uh, ways in which this could be implemented. There's no, I don't have a magic bullet, so I'm not like, a, I don't know, um, a grit or like people have these like one, 
one bowl, silver bullet solutions or mindset. Just change your mindset and it'll all be cured. I think we have to understand the deep evolved psychology, sexual psychology of men and women and the circumstances in which that psychology is activated in order to design prevention programs. So one of uh, one is to be aware that there are fundamental sex differences in our sexual psychology. And currently there's been this, um, in my view, a very anti-scientific, uh, what I call, what's called, other people call sex difference denialism, where, you know, somehow there's this uh, alarming thing that if we admit that men and women differ in any way, uh, that will, you know, be disastrous and result in discrimination against women. I actually think the opposite. Sex difference denialism harms women, uh, and it harms women in multiple ways. And I'll give just one example because I realize we, we don't have a ton of time left. And that is um, uh, laws surrounding sexual harassment and stalking. Uh, these laws are um, defined. They're, it's very rare among laws. They're defined by the psychological state of the victim. And this is unlike, let's say, mugging. You, you, a mugger is defined by the act. You mug a person. The psychological state of the victim doesn't matter. But with sexual harassment and stalking, it does. And there's a sex difference in perception of how upsetting and, and how harassing specific acts of sexual harassment are. Women perceive exactly the same acts, uh, such as touching a butt or staring or leering or making comments about breasts, as more sexually harassing than men perceive those exact same acts. The problem is that the laws are written typically according to what's called the reasonable person standard. Would a reasonable person perceive these acts as sexually harassing? And the reason this harms women, the failure to acknowledge the sex difference, is that what that means is if the reasonable person is a, a male judge or a male jury, then that is gonna, gonna harm women because he's gonna say, oh, well, you know, I have a male sexual psychology. This doesn't seem like a big deal uh, to me, whereas from a female perspective, it does. And so, uh, and so I've talked to legal scholars about how laws should treat these. Should you compromise and sort of split the difference or have two separate laws, one for men and one for women, reasonable men, reasonable women, or should you have a reasonable woman standard? And I think you could argue that you could have a reasonable woman standard um, because women tend to be the primary victims in this case of sexual harassment. And so I think ignoring or denying sex differences harms women when it comes to sexual violence um, and pretending that they don't exist harms them. And, but acknowledging them gives us uh, levers to change social circumstances, including the laws, in ways that can help women. Mm -hmm. Do you think we still have time for one more question? Sure, absolutely. Okay, great. So uh, I just wanted to ask you if we can also use, or for example, if people learn more about evolutionary psychology, is it possible that they can take some information in terms of uh, applying it to improving their romantic relationships, I mean, increasing their relationship sh uh, satisfaction, particularly when it comes to long-lasting romantic relationships? Yes, uh, yeah, I, I think you can, you can uh, use this information to beneficial effect. And, and one is, you, you raised very early the uh, notion of mate preferences, and both men and women have mate preferences. And um, so, uh, and I devote actually in the first book that I wrote, The Evolution of Desire, deals centrally with that, that fulfilling the partner's desires uh, in a mate is a, is a critical part of, um, of romantic, satisfying romantic relationships. But I actually have a section in the new book um, that I call an evolutionary recipe for minimizing conflict between the sexes. And so from an evolutionary point of view, you can do things to minimize uh, conflict. So keeping your mate value discrepancies well matched, uh, for example, mutually produced offspring where both the man and the woman have a, a similar stake in their reproductive vehicle, uh, not letting kin interfere because kin try to influence and manipulate 
uh, members of the couple. So keeping the kin at bay if they're trying to interfere. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then also perhaps even recognizing that, um, that, our, that, that even if you're in a committed mateship, people will be attract, you will be attracted to people who are other than your primary mate. And that doesn't mean that there's a lack of love. It doesn't mean that the love has gone away. Uh, it's part of just what our evolved psychology is all about. You know, we don't get mated for life and then decide, okay, I have no eyes for any other people. Um, as I said, we, we maintain backup mates. And so just even an understanding of it. So I'll give you a very quick example. One guy told me that he said, after reading about the men's desire for sexual variety, I, it helped me to be more faithful to my partner because I realized it didn't mean I wasn't in love with her. It just meant, oh, that's my evolved desire for sexual variety. So you have two different adaptations. One is desire for sexual variety. Another is the emotion, the evolved emotion of love, which is designed for long-term pair bonded committed relationships. And so even knowledge of our evolved psychology, I think can help people to have more satisfying romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's end on that positive note. And the book is again, When Men Behave Badly, The Hidden Roots of Sexual Deception, Harassment and Assault. Uh, Dr. Bus, just before we go, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, basically, my uh, easiest way is my name. Uh, so davidbus.com. If you just type in my name or davidbus.com, that will take you to my website. My website has links to the new book, um, When Men Behave Badly, and it also has links to all my other books and also my scientific articles, uh, which can be downloaded for free. Okay, great. I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Bus, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you, Ricardo. It's been a delight to chat with you. Hope we do it again. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. So it is thanks to people like you that the show has been running for such a long time, more than three years now. And I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, you can also find links to it in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, hit the subscription button and comment on it. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Kenny Litzka and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Ricalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Becker Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Pinha, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Alla Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliz, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergi Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardus France and Niroban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.